past and recognizing which cycle of life that you're in and recognizing that there are cycles and seasons in life. Now, I could talk about cycles and seasons, and I could break down what seasons are because seasons individually and cycles individually, and there's so many different components there, and, and, and I don't, certainly don't intend on today to give you a comprehensive uh, understanding of what cycles and seasons are and how they relate in your life. But what I do intend to do is I intend to display how God is, has the master plan and how he set up these particular cycles and give you an overview of the cycles so that you come to a, a kingdom understanding of what God is revealing so that we might move out and see what the relevance is and see what the necessity is and see why it's absolutely critical that we move out of the past to get to the future. You can't stay stuck in the past. If you stay stuck in the past, you'll never be able to move, to the, move into the future. You're, you're always going to limit yourself. Consider Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16, which talks about this very subject. Thus says Yahweh, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is saying here so much, but I want you to just, 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 just he's telling us, number one, in verse 16, who he is. And then in verse 18, he gives us a command. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Now, we all need to learn from our mistakes, right? We need to look at our past and we need to look and say, man, that was terrible. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I need to repent and turn back to God. And, and, and then, but now once I've repented and I've turned back to God, I need to move past that point. I can't keep holding on to my sin. I can't keep holding on to my failure. I can't keep holding on to my scabs and my scars. I need to let him heal me so that I can get up and be of greater use to him. I need to stop walking around with this limp. Sometimes it's a mental limp, isn't it? Because you're mentally damaged and you're not allowing God to heal you because you're still holding on to the pain and you don't want to move past the pain because you feel like you deserve it. Well, the truth be told, you do deserve it. All of us, we deserve death. We're unworthy. But Christ, because of his great love and because of his great mercy, he saw fit to save us. So will you take that which he gives us as a gift, our salvation in vain, and still hold on to the past and the pain, thinking you deserve it when Christ says, don't worry about it, I've taken it. Receive the gift. We talked about that last week. Are you just going to leave the gift on the shelf? Are you going to leave it on the counter and not open it? Are you not going to uh, embrace it fully? Are you not going to bring it and make it your own? Or are you still going to try to walk in the world and walk in the kingdom of heaven at the same time? It can't be both ways. Scripture going on says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and can expect no good thing from God. If you're double-minded, you're not going to get it. So you, either gonna be, you need to be single-minded with a single focus. And that focus needs to be on Christ. Now, if your focus is on Christ, how in the world are you having, you know, left eye looking in the past, right eye looking to the future? You can't see where you're going. You need to turn your head from the past, and you need to look towards the future, and you need to march that direction. Amen? Amen. We've got to get past the past. Christ says again, and here speaking, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Well, if he's telling you not to do it, who wants you to do it? Satan. Satan. He wants you to do it. He wants you to keep bringing up your pain, bringing up the past, bringing up your failures, bringing up your mistakes, bringing up, uh, you know, what you could have done better. He wants you to bring all that up because that ties you to the past and that inhibits you and that holds you back from uh, uh, achieving your full potential in the future. He says, I behold, if you, now, if you let go of the past, and you do what Christ is saying, this is what he's promising in verse 19. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? If you let go and you pay attention and you hold to the promise of Christ that he's going to do something new when you let go of the old 
And you say, okay, God, I'm letting go of the old. I'm moving forward. I'm moving past it. I'm not even going to think about it. I want what you have in store for me. So I'm marching towards you. I'm marching forward. What do you have for me? He says, now, you're paying attention. Let me give it to you. He can't even give it to you if you're still holding on to the past. It takes, it's a conscious decision we have to make on a daily basis. Sometimes it may not be just one moment where, you know, sometimes it can be. I mean, I'm not, I'm not limiting. I'm just saying sometimes, you know, if you have enough faith, it could be one moment where you say, you know what, I'm done with the past. I'm walking out and I'm moving on. If you have that much faith, God bless you. You just walked into a glorious and magnificent future with the king. If you don't have that much faith, you have to do that daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes every minute, every second, until your faith increases and your faith builds. You have to make this conscious decision to move forward and to release the past. To release means to let go. To let go of it. When you're thinking about letting go and releasing the past and moving forward, sometimes you need brothers and sisters there, ministers and pastors and people to encourage you, to assist you, to help you through it. You can't sometimes do these things alone. You can't do it alone. You know, I was thinking about this uh, before service on today, on the way here, and, and, and God was showing me this vision of this candle, right? This single flame. And we see this, this single flame here, and you say, okay, well, that represents Christ on the inside of me, right? He's alive on the inside of me, and I'm burning with the fire, the zeal of God. I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. Well, wonderful, right? That's great. And that's what you need in order to sustain life, that you might receive salvation. You have to have that flame burning, for if it's extinguished, you're of no value. If you try to do it alone, and sometimes it's overwhelming and you can't do it enough, you need someone else. Now, if somebody else is, is born again, blood washed, Holy Spirit filled, and they have the flame on the inside, when the two flames come together, does it diminish the first flame? No. It brings increase and the flame gets larger. So here's what you people worry about. Here's what pride says, right? Here's what pride says. Pride says this. Listen, don't talk to anybody. Don't ask anybody. Don't receive anybody. Don't bring anybody closer because I don't want anybody to come closer to you because if they come closer, you'll diminish and they'll increase. That's a lie. You'll become less important to them. You'll become less valuable to them. They'll see you as less than you are. They'll outshine you because now but that's the way the world works. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God works quite the opposite. Your flame is low. You got another brother in Christ that's strong in the flame. He comes, all of a sudden your flame gets stronger and your flames grow together and they become one. Why wouldn't you tell any, the, your brother or sister? Satan wants to keep you apart. That's the last thing he wants is two people coming together and having a stronger flame. Well, what happens if there's three? What happens if there's a whole church of believers who come together that week? We got a bonfire. What happens when two come together and their flame gets bright enough and then you come in contact with an unbeliever and you witness to that unbeliever? You have the potentiality to create a spark in their life where you light their unlit wick and they become alive in Christ. If you're just by yourself, it's harder to do. But Christ designed us to be in pairs, both brother and sister, going out in teams and brothers with brother. And then ultimately, obviously, in marriage. That you would never be alone. For the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. So we have the strength to overcome the past and the pain and anything else the enemy throws at us in numbers. I've said this before, and I think it's, it, it never, it's never going to be a lie. The number one thing, the number one person that the devil is afraid of is a man. Because if you have a man, he does, you know, women of God, that's why you see, again, I've said this before, but you have so many churches that are full of women. Why? Because the enemy's not, I'm not saying the enemy's not attacking women. Yes, he is attacking women, but he's not attacking women anywhere near the way he's attacking men. Not even close. Why? 
Because man is the head of the house and Satan knows it. Man has spiritual power and authority that supersedes that of woman. And Satan knows it. So he's set out to destroy man any way he can. Because you get a powerful man of God as the head of his house who accepts the responsibility and who moves forward. Now Satan says, man, I, that, that I'm afraid of. That I can't, I can't infiltrate that home. I can't get in. I can't do what I want to do. And then you get a man and a woman of Christ together. He can't touch you. Not unless God lets, you, lets him. Not unless God's teaching you. Not unless God's testing you. And anything that does come through and anything that does come about and any test that is put upon you, which there will be tests, You know that God's working it out. You know that he's allowed it. You know it's for your good. Unless you sin and you open up that door. But then we can repent and turn back. But we shouldn't go on sinning. Amen? Amen. We have to resist the enemy. We have to resist him not only in him tempting us, because temptation comes in so many facets, so many shapes, so many different forms. Temptation comes specific to the individual. Okay? So the Bible says that there was no temptation known to man that Christ did not encounter so that we, he would not, so that we might be able to, he could sympathize or re relatively he could empathize with us. He knows what we're going through because he went through it. We're never alone. There's no temptation, the Bible also says, that is uncommon to man. So saying that whatever you're going through, Satan wants you to think that you're the only one going through it and you're alone. That nobody knows how I feel and nobody really understands what I'm going through. Nobody knows how much it hurts me. I'm not diminishing your pain. I'm not saying that what your feelings, you know, you shouldn't be feeling. I'm just saying stop crying. Stop whining. Stop standing up and walking around, you know, with your, your head hung down and your arms hung limp and you're walking around like, you know, I'm in pain and I want everybody to recognize I'm in pain and I want everybody to tell me it's going to be okay. Why don't you get down on your knees and let him pick you back up? Why don't you humble yourself and go to your brother or sister and let them light you back up as y'all come before the throne together? That's what strength is. That's where power is. When faith comes alive and you overcome pride. You have to resist the enemy so that he'll flee from you. Temptation comes in all these different ways, but you have to be assured of this. The temptation that comes upon you as an individual, male or female, the temptation is specifically designed for you. Right? It's not like, you know, some, sometimes corporately Satan will attack us with all of, the, of one thing at one time. Other times, or, or, or even in that time, Satan will always... Through demons, he will always attack you individually with your greatest weaknesses, with your weak areas. So you're always fi fighting on two different battlefronts. Your individual sin, and individual temptation, I should say, and then corporate temptation. Consider Christ. Remember when he went out into the... We talked about this last week. Remember when he went out into the desert? And, and, he, and he went out there into the desert after he had uh, been fasting for the 40 days. Satan tempted him in all, you know, all these multitudes of ways. And he overcame Satan by the word of God, by speaking out that which it is he had already spoken and resisting him in that manner, in that facet. What was the objective of that? What was the purpose of, of Christ going out there so he could be tempted by Satan? What was the purpose? One of the purposes was to demonstrate that you can overcome, that he could overcome every temptation by Satan, that anything that Satan could throw at him, he could overcome. Now, even though he could overcome it, he still had to endure it, and he still had to suffer through it. But he did it so we could relate to him. He had to go out into the desert, and that's the same thing that we have to do. We have to go into the desert. What does that mean, we have to go into the desert? What I'm saying is this, is you have to go into the desert. See, part of fasting in, 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 in this concept of fasting in the natural, you know, not, receive, not taking of food and water, you do that for the purpose of, of humility, of, of humbling yourself before God, and realizing and recognizing that God is your provision, that He's your strength, and that calling upon Him. Now, 
when you're doing that, you're denying your flesh. You're denying yourself. Now, walking around with self-denial and self-abasement by, you know, fasting on a daily basis without purpose, fasting on a daily basis without God calling you to that fast is self-abasement and self-denial. And that's not pleasing to God whatsoever. The Bible calls that foolishness. That's just foolish. That's silly. You're not, you're not enjoying the good things of God that he's given unto you for you to receive when you deny yourself, uh, the, you know, these things. Healthy things. And proper um, portion. Now, when you go out into the desert this way, what Christ is saying or what Christ is demonstrating is the killing of the flesh. That you must die to the flesh, that the old man, the old man of the past, must die so that you might be born again and you might be renewed or you might be made new. Okay? That's important. I want you, because there's two times this happens in Scripture with Christ. That's one. Number two, as he goes into the Garden of Eden. When he goes into the Garden of Eden, he didn't go there to replenish or to renew himself. He went there to strengthen himself. He went to the Garden. Now, think about this. <laughs> I, I love it because Christ went to the desert to kill the flesh. That stands to reason, doesn't it? A lot of things die in the desert. He went to the Garden to cultivate faith. He went to the garden to cultivate faith, to pray, to be watered, to receive, so that he might have the power, the strength, the grace to overcome, to stand firm, so that he could prepare for the work that was coming ahead of him. We have to go through the same process Christ went through. Everything that he demonstrated, we have to go through. We have to go through a desert period in our life where we're going to have, where it's going to be dry, it's going to be hot, and our flesh is going to scream and our flesh is going to cry, but ultimately our flesh must die if we're to give birth and give new life. Then when we receive new life, we're going to come to a point in our time, a cycle, a period, a season in our life where we need to get into the garden and we need to cultivate faith and strength and we need to come to the place where we rely upon God so that we might be of service to others and bear fruit which glorifies him and pleases him. Makes sense, to bear, makes sense to bear fruit in the garden, doesn't it? When you plant yourself firm. These two times were both times of testing, even though they had different purposes. Every test that you go through in your life doesn't always have the same purpose. Sometimes it has different purposes. But I want you to check this out. In the desert and in the garden, even though there were both times of testing, even though he had to endure great pain and suffering in both of them, at the end of each of those tests, the desert and the garden, angels came to him and ministered to him both occasions to strengthen him. Why is that relevant? Because at the end of every test comes refreshing. If you could just hold on. If you just persevere, if you just stand, if you just fight to the very end, there will come a time. God's not going to leave you in that dismantled, broken state. He'll refresh you. He'll pick you up. He'll minister to you himself. Amen? Speaking of testing, let's look at James chapter 1. Verse 2 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which Yahweh has promised to those who love him. Now, uh, there's a lot to say here, but let's just look at it for a, uh, for a moment. Consider joy when you're tested. Now, listen, when you're going through it, it's anything less than joyful unless you've learned how to be content in all things, unless you've learned how to receive joy, unless you learn how to walk in peace, which we have recently discussed in other messages. But now, I want you to think about this. If you, when you've went through a trial in the past, through a hard time in the past, 
and, and you look at that trial and you remember when you were going through it, how miserable you were, how tiring some it was, how, how, how just hard it was. And you know, you know you come out of it because you're here. Think of the trials that have come later or even the trials that you're in right now and compare those trials to the ones of the past. You'd gladly go back and take some of the ones of the past, wouldn't you? You'd gladly go back, man, I'll take that five times compared to what I went through that one time. But let me tell you something. Those five times or those five different occasions or those other situations that you went through all individually produced faith on the inside of you to continue to trust God so that when this big one comes, you might be able to endure it. It's like an athlete, is it not? I mean, you, yeah, when you first start lifting weights or you first start running, you know, yeah, you, know you get, it, you get you know, down the block about halfway and you can't go anymore. <laughs> then you work yourself up and you can make it around the block. Then you work at it some more and now you can go a mile. Then it becomes two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles. So that type of running, that type of in, uh, persevering, that type of pushing through produces endurance. Do we need that endurance for what is to come to be the bride? Can you imagine how much we need? You should be grateful for the testing. That's why he says, consider it joy. Because it produces endurance. Now let endurance, let it give permission to endurance to have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete. Now, Perfection, perfect and complete. We, uh, I've discussed this before, but let's just go back to this word complete for just a moment. This word means complete and lacking nothing. It means complete in the mind, in the body, and in the spirit. That you might be made whole. That you might be healed in every one of those as aspects and perfect into the way that Christ desires you to be. So that you're lacking in nothing. Now, moving on to 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, the outcome of it all is that you will receive the crown of life which Yahweh has promised, has promised to those who love him. Now, that's the end result of it all. Once the trial is over, the world finds you guilty. Satan finds you guilty. Christ comes and sets you free. And you receive the crown of life because you endured to the end and didn't turn your back on Christ. You kept the faith. Come on, I know people in here have gone through hard times where they thought about giving up. I know about time. What is this all for? What's the purpose of it? Why, you know, God, why is God letting me go through this? Does God really, maybe he doesn't exist. Maybe he doesn't. And the enemy starts coming in and planting them seeds. And then the good things you're hearing, the birds of the air, the demons come and start reaping and start sowing and start taking away all that stuff that's planted on the inside. And, and now you find, that's just, he's got you right where you want you. What do you do? You better call a brother. You better reach out. You better not let pride take hold of you. You better pick up the phone. You better call, the, you call your father in heaven, and you better request some backup. Then you better call your brother and let him come help you. Don't let him cut off your communication. But guess what? At the end of your test, at the end of your trial, at the end of it all, at the end of it comes refreshing. The greatest refreshment we're going to receive is what? When we go to heaven. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Here again he says, let it have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete. So we need to be complete. Okay, I want to, I want to take you somewhere that we're going with these cycles in the past on today. Don't return to the incomplete. I should have it up here. Be complete. Don't return to the incomplete and start back over the cycle. Okay? This is what we do, I, myself included. We do this. We, we go through a time of testing and trial, trial, but we don't learn the lesson that God's trying to teach us. So we have to retest and we have to do it over again. You fail it again? God's gracious enough to allow you to take the test again. But you keep repeating the cycle, keep repeating the cycle, keep repeating the cycle. And you keep walking around the mountain, walking around the mountain, walking around the mountain. And you never get into the promised land. You never get into the future. You never get into what God has you because you can't even move past the past.
What's the counterfeit of cultivating faith? It's cultivating the seed of sin. Christ went into the garden to cultivate faith. Instead, when you repeat the cycle, you're cultivating sin. Because it's the sin that you're in that bring, it keeps you tied to the past. Because you can never move past the sin. You never learn your lesson. You never repent and move on. You always disobey God, and you don't listen to what Isaiah said. It says, don't ponder the things of the past. Don't even, that means ponder. Don't even think about them. Once you've dealt with them, they need to be dealt with. But once they've been dealt with, move on. I'm going to tell you, I, I've said this a long time ago, but I'll say it again. If anybody ever tells you that you, you can't move on until you, need, until you get closure, just say the devil is a liar. Closure came on the cross. I don't need closure. I don't need to deal with him. I don't need to talk with him. I don't need to work it out. I don't need to, I don't need to, to, to get, get everything wrapped up so it makes sense to me. I don't need that. I need Christ. If I have him, I have everything. He brings closure through his blood. He is my closure. On the cross, he said, it is finished. Amen? Amen. Verse 14 says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away, enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it, brings, brings, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Let me repeat that one more time. But each one, that's us, when is tempted, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, the desires of his flesh, then when lust has conceived, given birth, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So the idea that comes to mind or the concept, remember, every sin we participate in, every one of us, me included, every sin that we participate in is a conscious decision, right? We, we, we make some decision. Sometimes we just, sometimes we don't intend for it to go that far, but we open the door to the enemy and the enemy comes in like a flood because we open that door. Well, I didn't plan to do that. The guy that shot somebody, you know, and, 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 and mur murdered them. He was just angry. He, he opened the door to that anger. He opened the door to their house. He should have never went over to his house that angry. He didn't want to kill them. He didn't plan on killing them. He was just going to scare them. But all of a sudden, he ended up shooting them. He, does, he says what? I don't know what came over me. He's truly sorry. He's truly repentful. He truly is, is, is humbled. He's truly broken. He's truly disgusted, even with himself. And he didn't ever even want it to do that. He just wanted to scare them. But he ended up killing them. And people, the society looks down upon that man and says he's a murderer, he's a scumbag, he deserves to die. I'm not saying, some people don't repent. Some people aren't broken. Some people, but for the man that does something like that and is repentful and recognizes the error of his ways, and it was Satan or it was a demon that overcome, overcame him, the first problem was this, is you opened the door to the sin. You made a conscious decision to sin, to break God's uh, command and his, uh, his law. We all do the same thing. So when we're tempted and we open the door to the enemy, then we're carried away and we're enticed. Think about that. Seductive, luring, drawing. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Remember, the counterfeit of cultivating faith is the counter cultivating the seed of sin. Let's look at another idea of testing. And moving past the past, this is 1 Peter chapter 6. I mean, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. It says through 25. That's incorrect. Don't take note of that. I messed up. 1 Peter chapter, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, to reclaim your joy, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, the what? The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result, to what? Result, okay? I need you to underline that word. In praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. Okay. What is the result? I'm going through all these various trials and tribulations. I've been distressed by them. If I prove to be faithful 
That which I'm birthing is going to be more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though it's been purified. I am being purified, and at the end of my test, the end of my trial, the end of my tribulation, when I have persevered, when I have endured, the result is that I will praise him, I will glorify him, and I will honor him at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. Hold on. I, I, you, I can see I got blank faces. You ain't getting it. The result of the trial and the tribulation is, the outcome is, is that I'm going to praise him and honor him and I'm going to glorify him. Why will I honor him? Why will I praise him? Why will I glorify him after I've gone through all that pain? What, how, why am I going to do it? I'm going to do it because if I stand and if I endure and if I persevere and if I overcome, he will reveal himself to me in greater measure. That's why I glorify him. That's why I honor him. That's why I praise him. Because right there it says, at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. Not just knowing who he is, but knowing who he is to you because you're talking with him. You met him and he's revealed more of himself to you. See, we know Christ a little bit. When we go through stuff and we trust him and we're tested by him, and at the end of the outcome of it is that we've overcome and we've conquered through him, he reveals more of himself to us. We get to know him better. When you get to know him better, you get to know the creator, the king of the universe. You get to know him better. He reveals more to himself. And the Bible says the, the mysteries of the world are revealed to those who walk upright, who walk in righteousness, who walk and trust him. So at the end of it all, he brings greater revelation of who you, he is to you. At the end of it all comes refreshing. So there's cycles and there's seasons in our lives. We corporately and individually. And we need to learn and we need to be, begin to comprehend that. And I, I did a message a while back, which this one ties into called the big picture. I did another one a long time ago called 2020. And I've had several others that are kind of in this same vein. But I, I hope to share with you this new this concept in a new way today. We're we know we got to move out of the past. We're commanded so we can get to the future. But first, we need to see the big picture. But the big picture, this time I'm going to display it to you in a way, in a grand scheme of things from inception of humanity, or uh, let me rephrase, through the creation. Let me re i got to do it again. Not only through the creation, through Christ coming and saying, let there be light in Genesis chapter 1. From Genesis 1 to Revelations, I want to kind of try to, I'm going to try to bring it all together and conceptualize it for you so that you can kind of get, get the picture. It's, it's, it's a mental picture I'm trying to draw so that you might understand your purpose in the grand scheme of things and how Christ has planned it all out perfectly. I, I just pray that we're going to get this accomplished because we need it. We're going to need this. If, I, if you know, I, I didn't have long to prepare this, but I think it's going to make sense. Let's go. Seasons, right? Okay. That's all we need to know. We're done. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Y'all got it now? We can, let's go home. Hallelujah. <laughs> seasons. Do you think God created day and night and seasons and everything he created just because just it sounded good at the moment? Or do you think he did it by purpose? Again, what I'm trying to share with you today is not comprehensive, but I want to share an aspect of it, right? Spring. Spring is a time for new birth. When new birth comes in the summer, when the plant has grown, then the plant begins to bear fruit. And along the way, other plants are born they're in different parts of, this, the, of spring in the summer season that, that have seeds that have fallen and passed that are being watered by the summer rain so that when fall comes, there's a different type of harvest, a fall crop, so that we might be fed both summer and in winter. Now, fall gets here. We have a new type of fruit. 
And we have a new harvest that comes that will tend to us and that will feed us all the way through the winter. And then here we are in spring again. And even though spring is a season of new birth and the plants are coming back alive, there are still, the, 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 uh, most people don't recognize this, at the beginning of spring, when everything first starts to bud, the first budding plants that come about, the majority of them, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say the majority, a great many of them are edible. Right? So a great many of the plants that first spring up, the, 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 the spring mix, if you want to call it, right, is edible. Now, how does this help us? We understand that a little bit, but as a Christian, you have a spring season in your life. That's when you're reborn. You have a summer season on your life. That's when you're on fire. And you're chasing after God. And you're, and you're, you're learning and you're growing and he's watering. And you're planting. And then you get the harvest in the fall. Then you have those winter seasons where things are dormant for a little while and, and you rest. So then when spring comes around, you're replenished. And the seasons perpetuate and they follow and they follow until the very end of it all is the winter season again. And that's when you perish, lest you be raptured. So these seasons happen in our lives, these seasons of, of new beginnings and new birth and infilling. And these seasons also happen, can happen weekly or even daily, if you think about it. During the day, you wake up, and you might not wake up refreshed, but at some point in the day, when you get into God's presence, you get refreshed. And when you get refreshed, the byproduct of that is you get on fire. And the byproduct of getting on fire is you go out and plant, and you sow, and you water, and you produce fruit, and you bear fruit, which enables you to get a harvest for the fall. And then the fall comes, and then the winter comes, and when the winter comes, it's time to rest. And you go to sleep, and the day's work is done. So these seasons are indicative that he created, are indicative of not only the... the, the the seasons of the year, but the seasons in our lives and the seasons in our daily lives. Individually, as individuals, here's kind of the process. One, we hear the Word of God. Second thing that happens is you have to receive the word of God, meaning that you have to, you heard it. Some people say, you'll hear it, and then they just go on their merry way. We, the parable of the seed of the sower again, right? So some people hear it, they don't receive it, they question it, they argue with it, whatever. But eventually it comes to a point when you become born again, you have to receive the word. So you hear the word, you receive the word, and after receiving the word, you're born again. Now, you're born again. That means you meet, you meet with Christ, you repent of your sins, you turn away, and you're born again. Then after you're born again comes the next part, which is the pruning. Now, this pruning is the testing. This pruning is the cutting things off of you that are ungodlike, that are not worthy of him, that, are, that, that need to be cut off of you in your life so that you might grow and produce good fruit, right? Then after the testing and the pruning comes the times of refreshing or renewing after the test. Your faith is renewed after every trial and tribulation. It's refreshed. Then after that comes a time of feeding where God is feeding you. He's watering you. And now with that, you're going out, you're planting and you're watering. And then after the result of that planting and watering, now you're bearing fruit. At the end result of after you've bared fruit and you've gone down this road, then it's either going to come death or the rapture. Either way, it's going to be one and the same. There's no differentiation, really. You die, you lay asleep, you don't even know you're dead, you're lying there, and then you're raptured. Right? So either one, it's going to be one and the same. And then after the rapture comes judgment. And then, behold, a new world, a new heavens, new earth. Now, I, I, I want you to look at this because I don't have time to compare all three, but later we're going to compare two of these cycles. This is the individual cycle for a Christian, a true follower of Christ, right? 
This is, uh, uh, again, so you hear the word, you receive the word, you become born again, then you have to go through the fire, the testing, you become refreshed and renewed, and then you begin to feed, plant, and water, which is a result of bearing, and you begin to bear fruit with others, you begin to make disciples of others, then you are raptured, then you're judged, and then there's a new world. So this is kind of the idea. Now, what, okay, we're going to look at why this is significant in just a moment. Let's look at the world cycle now. This is an individual cycle. Now I'm talking about the world, right? Global, this earth we're on. In the beginning was, uh, it's not even on here, I don't have it on here, so, uh, I didn't add it. But in the beginning was, the, up there above void should say the Word. Okay? So, in the beginning was the Word. So, in the beginning, God was present. He was already here. He was available. He was alive. So, in the beginning was God's Word. In the Word, the Word looked upon the darkness and the world, world was void. Okay? So the Bible says it was void and it was formless. We discussed this last week. I'm going to give you another aspect of that void. The world was without Christ. The world was, was, was without God. Okay? So you have the Word and then you have the void. And then after the void, you have where light comes. That's Christ comes. The light comes into the world. Where This is where in Genesis 1, he says, let there be light. He gives permission to light to come. And light, the Bible says, separates the darkness. And there becomes a day and there becomes a night. There becomes a differentiation between good and evil because there was no good before God came and God separated it. Now, I, I don't want to take you, I, I, I don't want to go, go too far here, but if we just stay where you're at, but if we were to go back, we would remember that the individual hears the word, receives the word, but before he was able to receive the word, he was void of God. Then the light comes and separates from the darkness. That next thing was, was being born again. Now you're separated from the world. Do y'all see where I'm going with this now? Okay, so you're, well, we're, i got to keep going. I can't go through all of them. Now, the light separated from the darkness. So now, this is, we're talking about the world. We're looking at the globe. And then, lust in the Garden of Eden, lust was the desire to do that which is not of God's will by the enticing of the craftiness of the serpent caused the birthing of sin. Sin came into the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Eden was shut down and man went into the world and brought sin with him. Lust birthed sin. As a result, death came. The result of sin is death. We weren't designed to die. You ever see why, you ever wonder why people are so fascinated with immortality? Simple. Because it's ingrained in us. We weren't meant to die. Now death comes. So now men are dying. The world is dying and decomposing, literally. And the next thing that happens is God comes to save humanity or give them a hope of salvation through the law, which is the Ten Commandments. So the world now knows a differentiation between right and wrong because the Ten Commandments are offered. The Ten Commandments are given to us that we might differentiate what God will and what's not His will, even as it is written. After this, after the law, because law wasn't sufficient to save humanity, it wasn't sufficient to save the world because man couldn't obey the law. Christ came. With Christ, He brought grace. Grace is not, once again, grace is not just um, saying, well, it's just grace, I'm saved, I'm saved by grace, so therefore I can go on sinning. No, grace is the power to obey God. Grace is the power to overcome sin. You need to, get, you need to memorize those two definitions and put them in your spirit because that's what, how you respond. Grace is that power that Christ himself brought, for he is grace, to overcome come sin Grace came to the world through the Son. Star of Bethlehem, we, we got the story, right? Christ comes. Now, because of that, 
we now have a choice to follow the light or to follow the darkness, to follow Christ or to follow Satan. We have a choice. For those who follow him, we now see that Christ comes and Christ bears fruit, which the purpose of bearing the fruit was to destroy the work of the enemy. Christ bearing fruit was him dying on the cross, re re being resurrected and ascending to heaven, and that overcame the enemy, right? So I want to make this, and Christ said, I came for one purpose, and that purpose is to destroy the work of the enemy. So he bears fruit, and the fruit is born on the earth, and the fruit that is born on the earth, quite contrary to the fruit in the garden of the Eden that caused man to fall from the tree of knowledge, this fruit is the fruit of our salvation, is the fruit of grace, is the fruit of Christ that Christ born, and the fruit that he bore, this is awesome, because the fruit, the fruit that we, we want to bear fruit, the Bible says, that endures forever. We want to bear fruit that lasts uh, perpetually and that is pleasing unto God. We want to bear fruit like little Christ. Christ came and he bared fruit, then his fruit feeds all of humanity for all time. So he bears that fruit which ultimately and eternally destroys the work of the enemy when we, par when we partake of the fruit that he bore, the work that he did, that we might receive him. Then the next thing that uh, occurs here in the world is now we have Christ that has come in the world, and he bears this fruit which we just discussed. The offshoot or the byproduct of the fruit is that he makes disciples. And the disciples go out and they duplicate themselves all over the entire face of this globe. Changing the world forever. And offering change to those who are in the, in the world that they might receive a forever. At the end of time, we'll come to the place and the point where we're raptured. Right? So we know what that means. Remember, the rapture isn't the secret, second, secret third coming or second coming of Christ. Right? So we've already taught on that. After the rapture, God judges the whole world in righteousness. And then we have a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I want you to see how that parallels with the individual cycle that we go through with the world cycle. But now I want to take you to another cycle, to Christ cycle. So this is Christ cycle. Through... Gabriel, well, first Christ and the, the Father and the Son get together and they says, it's pleasing unto me if you go down and you save humanity, right? They say, okay, send Gabriel. Gabriel goes and he tells Mary. Mary hears that she's going to receive a son through the Holy Spirit, which we already discussed. So through the hearing of the word, she received the word. Through the reception of the word, Christ was birthed into darkness. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says without Christ, we are all in darkness. Christ was birthed into darkness. The light, Christ is the light, separates, is separate from the darkness. That means he never sinned. He was without sin. He was the light. He always remained separate. From the darkness. Even though he was tempted, he never sinned. He never gave way to sin. The next thing that occurs is grace. Christ's grace is the power that he receives to overcome the enemy upon the earth through the reception or the receiving of his birthright at the baptism of the River Jordan. He receives the grace, the power to overcome sin overcome Satan, the father of sin. Okay? He receives that grace. Now, now that the, 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 the grace is uh, presented unto us, then a choice is presented to him to follow his father and do that which is pleasing in his sight or to fall in the weakness of his humanity and give up. Garden of Gethsemane. 
what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't, don't, don't ever discount it. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane was the pinnacle upon which all humanity, the thread upon which it hangs. He had the choice. And he said, he cries out to the Father. He says, what? Not my will be done, but your will be done. Because of the choice that he made, he went to the cross. And upon that cross, he bared fruit. And the fruit that he bared upon that cross, he paid our debt so that all humanity might be saved, so that we all might partake of that fruit and live. Then the next thing that occurs here is his resurrection, right? So he dies. He's resurrected. He overcomes hell. He overcomes the grave. And he's made new. Then he promises, after his resurrection, before he goes and ascends to heaven, after his resurrection, he appears to the disciples, and he promises them the Holy Spirit. We know about that already. Then after he promises them the Holy Spirit, he ascends into heaven. After he ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes. And then he, he's able to make disciples of all nations through the Holy Spirit, through the empowering of the Spirit of God. And then finally, after that, the next thing that Christ will do after he ra the ascension, we, we, the next thing that he will do is that we, he'll call us up, which is part of that ascension. We'll talk about it in a moment. But the rapture, and the next thing he does after that, he judges the world. After he judges the world, he destroys the world and makes a new world. Okay, let's parallel these, right? I, I, have, a, I have one slide for that for the sake of time. So we have the Christ cycle first. Him and the Father are talking, and Mary hears in the beginning of the world, the very beginning of time, thousands and thousands of years ago was the Word. He was birthed into darkness. Thousands of years ago, in the inception of mankind, in the inception of the earth, the world was formed, it was out void, and there was no light. Next, the light, he is the light, and he's separated from all humanity. Now we see... In the beginning of time, light separated from the darkness. The next thing we see, he is tempted by Satan. Here, man is tempted by Satan in the world, and he gives in to that sin, gives in to that temptation, and birth, sin is birth. Next, we see the law. After the law, when the law came, the Ten Commandments came, then we see man is judged, and that man dies through the law and by the law because he can't obey the law. So death had come upon the world at this point because of sin. Now we have the law and we have uh, grace is the next one here. So now we see that Christ is grace and that grace came to humanity through the whole world through the Son. Then we see Christ had a choice in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we see that mankind now has that same choice that Christ had. To either follow Satan or follow his father. Then we see that Christ on the cross, he bared fruit and he paid our debt. Now we have the ability, to, the world has the ability to bear, bear fruit as well, which is the continuation of destroying the work of the enemy. We can bear the same fruit that Christ bared. Then we see there is the resurrection. Okay? Um, the resurrection is when Christ goes up and then he promises and he returns, he promises the Holy Spirit. Uh, which is down there, and then through that, we can make disciples, or he duplicates himself throughout all of humanity. So the world cycle is, uh, is there again, and now we have the ascension. So Christ ascended into heaven. In the whole entire world, in the end of times, we will ascend into heaven just like he did. It's called the rapture. Then at the end of that, Christ is the one who will judge the world. We will be judged, and he destroys the world. And makes a new world. So we see that there's a cycle, that there's a plan, right? The individual plan, which I didn't have time to put it up there and to con contrast it here. The individual plan, Christ cycle, and the world cycle is all, uh, 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 it's all uh, synonymous. It's all the same. It's all, um, there's a word I'm looking for, but it doesn't matter. It all, it all act, it equals out the exact same thing, the exact same function. And we see that exactly what occurred. And, and this, you have to look beyond what you're looking at in the natural. You have to look and you have to see this, that God's plan from the formation of the world to the, to the end of the world, he created this plan. Christ followed the plan in his humanity exactly. 
the plan that we receive in our humanity when we become born again is exactly the same as Christ's plan and ultimately is the same plan for all humanity for all time in the end. So the plan remains the same. The plan remains unchanged. This ha the only difference is this happened over a period of millennium. This happened over a period of 33 years. How long it happens with us is up to us. But the plan's always there. It's always the same. Well, hold on. I want you to get, I want, we're going to close. We're about to close. I got, all I have is one more scripture. If you want to move past the past, then you can't repeat the same cycles over again, right? So you don't want to come back. You, you could go back to the individual slide. You don't want to come, hear the word, receive the word, born again, get all the way down to where you're bearing fruit, right? Or you're being fed and planted, or you're being renewed, and then have to go all the way back up to where you're born again, which is repenting. Every time you sin, you break the cycle. And you have to return to a, a point in the past so that you can move forward again. Because you break the cycle, you break the connection between you and the Father. It doesn't mean ultimately that you have to start all over, but it does mean that you're going to be tested all over. That you're never going to fulfill the full potential unless you get past the past and don't repeat the mistakes of the past and learn from your mistakes. So in this condition, then you're repeating the cycle, and now when you look at yourself and you look at the cycle that Christ followed, you look at the cycle of the entirety of the world and for the full history of the world, then you look at your individual place, you can see why it's so imperative that you break that cycle and move past the past and into the future to receive the potential so you could be who God created you to be and do what God created you to do so you don't have to repeat it again. So that you can play out your part in the existence of all humanity for all time. So you can function the way God created you to function, the way he designed you to function. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. First things have passed away. No more crying, no more tears, no more mourning. The Lamb, God, is amongst us. God came amongst us once as the Son of God. As the Lamb, He returns as the Lion. As He returns as the Lion, then He says, as he, the first time He came, He gave us the ability to be born again. The second time He comes, he gives us the opportunity to dwell with him, and then the earth will be born again. Verse 5 says, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We must endure the testing, overcome the testing, so that we might be refreshed, and the final refreshing is that we shall inherit new life, and the old the world will be done away with in its entirety. That's why we want to get out of the past and continue to receive revelation of who he is so that we might reveal him to others. He who overcomes will inherit these things. He says, behold, I'm making all things new. God, 
I, it's hard to describe this, but, but, but look, I mean, you look at the earth and the inception of the earth, and he says, let there be light, and he says, let there be a separation between that and darkness. Let there be the waters of the earth. Let there be, behold, I'm making this new. And he created a garden of Eden, and he created man, and he made things new. Then he came to the earth as a savior, and he gave us the ability for us to be made new, be born again, remade, renewed. So now we're born again. Then he says, you know what, I'm coming back, and this time when I come back, I'm going to make everything new, not just you. Just like I did the first time, I make all things new again. Do you see how the plan overlaps through individuals, through corporately, through globally? But he gives a warning here, verse 8. Oh, wait, yes, verse 8. But the cowardly and unbelieving, that's believing, and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and adulterers, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The cowardly and unbelieving. Well, that's why he always says, what? Take courage. Have faith. You have to endure the test to the end. If you fail the test and you keep failing the test, then you keep on sinning, and if you keep on sinning, you're practicing sin. And if you practice sin, then you're not of God. See how it all comes together. The cowardly. Why? Because in the end days, the bride is who Christ is forming. Well, if we go back and we look again, we see here that he says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell amongst them. And then it says, The first earth uh, passed away, and there's no longer any sea, and the whole, holy Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. It's the bride that is made ready. But if the bride cannot be a coward, the bride has to be a warrior. The bride has to be strong. The bride has to overcome evil, overcome temptation overcome testing so that she might be refreshed so that she might be perfect so that she might be complete so that he might reveal himself I'm hoping some synapses are firing and some things are connecting verse 9 then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That's who we want to be. Don't, can you, can you, Christ is proud of his bride here. He's proud of her. He's saying, listen, there they got it. They're the ones who get it. They're the ones who, you know, they're not just a church. They're not just a gathering of believers. This is the followers. These are the sold out ones. These are the ones who are willing to die for me. These are the ones who, who fight for me. These are the ones who, when they sin, they repent and they chase after me and they don't want to sin anymore. These are the ones who love me and they want to be made complete because they want to honor me. They want to glorify. They want to praise me. And they do that automatically when I reveal myself to them. They want more of me. I want them too. I'm proud of them. I love them. They're my bride. They're perfect. They're complete. Come look at them. He shows us off. Like any man would show off his beautiful wife. Are we willing to be that bride? Are we willing to be made complete? You can't be made complete until you move out of the past, till you let go, till you release it, till you humble yourself, till you learn your lesson, until you hold on and you ask for help, not only from him but from others, until you learn how to rejoice in your trials knowing that it produces faith and that faith will have its perfect result and at the end of that test will come refreshing just like at the end of the cycle comes the rapture and comes a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more pain, suffering, or tears. The past is done away with. And I can promise you this. When the past is done away with, when the new heaven, when the earth is done away with and there's a new heaven and a new earth, you won't be pondering the old earth anymore. Remember how terrible it was? You won't want to recall that because you're living in the goodness and the graciousness and the light of Christ. And there is no more darkness. Amen? As we stand.